Stefano and all these people we, we've talked about, R. Fiori. Um, and uh, Fiori, yeah, he was good. He's very good. Yeah. And Picar, Harvey Picar was writing uh, really yeah. well. I mean, it. The nice thing about it, I think, at the time was that it, the comics world, and maybe we'll talk about this later, was small enough so that an underground cartoonist could be reading it and also the guy who wrote Spider-Man. And there was this sort of common platform that was shared uh, that made for interesting tension uh, between the two camps and made for just an interesting package that you could read some you know, Spider-Man writer uh, in it and also Kim Deitch and uh, a review of an obscure you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles parody and also a review of, of Mouse. You know, it, 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 had, it, it had a sort of variety that, uh, because there were not that many comics being published, that you, you can't really do anymore. I mean, and even dueling reviews sometimes. And dueling reviews, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, if I can say one thing, you know, I mean, one thing we did, I guess most markedly in the 80s, is we drew this bright line between mainstream commercial corporate comics and what we thought of as um, more aesthetically ambitious cartooning, which you know, in which I would place all the underground, no, not all the underground cartoonists, but you know, the best guys in the underground, Kim and Robert Crumb and Bill Griffith and Gilbert Shelton and Jack Jackson and so forth. Um, and I think back then we did make a distinction between the artists we considered true artists um, and all the artists that we thought were just turning out pap for corporate comics. Um, anyway, I don't know, that, that seemed like an important distinction to make then and possibly now. Yeah, I mean, do you think it remains important now? I mean, th th that was the other thing that we wanted to talk about a little bit, is that you kind of won the battle, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and so where... Or did he? Or, or did you? Did you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... It, In a sense, yeah. Where does that kind of leave you and also where does that kind of lead critically? Well, it, it, it means that there are, are, no, are not, there's no bright line like that anymore. I mean, there, I mean, things have just, things have become much blurrier and um, I think in a way more difficult to distinguish. I mean, I think it's more difficult to distinguish between um, good work and bad. It's, it's more difficult to articulate standards in comics, um, which makes it, I think, all the more important to do that, to figure out you know, what represents good cartooning, good work. Um, but paradoxically, it makes it much more, much harder to do that. Um, and as a result, I think it's done less. I mean, we would have tremendous arguments within the magazine. Um, but they were usually from the same point of view, which is that the person thought this was, you know, this was good art. Uh, I mean, like Harvey Picar, and uh, I know Harvey Picar and, and Bob Fiore would go at it. Um, probably on more than one occasion, we would have arguments between critics who wrote for the magazine. Um, but they were all coming from the point of view that, you know, there was such a thing as, as work that you could distinguish as, as good art, and, and there were arguments about what, what that meant. Um, there just seems to be much less of that now, and I'm not exactly sure why. Maybe it's because well, I think all these categories have collapsed, you know, highbrow, lowbrow, middlebrow, mass art. It's all become this, this gigantic glob of pop culture that's harder and harder to, um, to you know, to talk about in a, in a coherent way. I mean, partly that's it. I'm not sure that leaves you with... <laughs> also, maybe it's easier to ignore this kind of discussion if you don't want to, whereas before the Comics Journal and Wizard we're not that far apart in a certain way mm -hmm. um, in terms of part of the conversation in the community. Or, I don't know. I'm just, who knows. Was there, was there a moment when you felt like uh, you were starting to win the argument? Um, there probably was. Um, I mean, that probably would have been, you know, that probably would have been sometime in the 90s. I mean, in the last 10 or 15 years, comics have become more accepted. They're now reviewed in the New York. Times book review, they're legitimate, um, you know, um, uh, media, which they never were you know, in the 70s and 80s. Um, so in a sense, you know, we, 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 we won that. Um, 
but I'm not, I'm not, I okay. don't know, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Well, um, I remember reading that when you were young, you, uh, one of the critics that you were really into was uh, John Simon. Mm-hmm, yes. And uh, you, I might have this wrong, but you wrote him a letter, or, or sent him the comics journal or something, and talking about your goals to do it, and he was totally confused by the whole concept. Um, yeah, something like that. Where'd you hear that? Um, yeah, I was reading, uh, I was reading John Simon, I and mean, he was one of the coterie of film critics who were writing back then. It was John Simon and Pauline Kael, uh, Andrew Saris, Stanley Kaufman, and they all had their venues. You know, Stanley Kaufman was in the New Republic, and John Simon was in New York Magazine. And anyway, yeah, I did, I, I wrote to Simon, and um, I think I probably did send him a copy of the Comics Journal. Um, I remember writing him, um, because he was writing a language column for a journalism magazine called More Magazine, M-O-R-E. And I sent him something that I considered a travesty that I read in some magazine. Um, it was by some, um, I don't know, some um, technologically oriented writer who was uh, making some absurd claims about computers and language. Anyway, I sent him this and I basically said, you know, why don't you, you know, why don't you write about this guy in one of your columns? Uh, which he did, and he did write me write write me back, and um, I think he didn't quite understand why someone who followed his column about language <laughs> could publish a magazine about comic books. Um, now, more recently, I, I sent him some graphic novels, and he actually read Joe Sacco's Garage to and liked it, um, mm. but he couldn't quite figure out the rest of the stuff I sent him. But he understood that. I mean, he was in a prison pit. Yeah, yeah, right. right. Um, but he, yeah, he read, he read Garage to Beat, but he's from there. That's why, he, I think that's why he, he took to it. Right. Um, he's Serbian. Um, and he couldn't quite wrap his head around, you know, the other, the other stuff I sent. But yeah. Kim, when, uh, were, did you ever hear artists, um, was, was there a lot of awareness among artists that you know of of the Comics Journal where people they're complaining about the coverage they got, for example, or, 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 or were they just into it? Were they excited about the idea of its existence? Or most of the other people I know or in the business are mm -hmm. familiar with the Comics Journal. I never heard anybody cursing it out. <laughs> I, I, I think it's always been received as good recreational reading. <laughs> <laughs> well, you traveled in circles that probably wouldn't curse us out. I mean, there, there's that bright line. I mean, the, 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 um, the artists and writers who worked for mainstream comics, I mean, they were a little schizophrenic because we were championing their rights as creators. I mean, one of the things we did was we, um, we were championing creators' rights throughout the 1980s because um, Marvel and DC and the other um, corporate comics really treated their artists shabbily. Um, they owned all the work. They did not give royalties. They paid a page rate. Uh, and that was it. There were no, there was no, there were no pensions. There were no, there was no health care. There was nothing. And um, and of course, the artists owned nothing. Uh, they didn't own a piece of their work. They didn't have any say in, in you know, with with the work they did. And so we spent a large part of the 80s, and I guess um, the late 70s, when there was um, there, there was a guild that that tried to form in 1978 or so. But anyway, I mean, we were championing their rights while simultaneously attacking the work that they did. Uh, um, so, you know, we would get this weird mixed reaction, like we kind of like you, but we also really hate what you write about our, our work. We appreciate you. But we were the only magazine they could go to to air their grievances against Marvel and DC. Um, but I'd probably say they disliked us more than they liked us. But the underground um, cartooning community, I mean, I think we genuinely like their work. And yeah, it was great for us. Right, right, exactly, and, uh, exactly. Um, so there's that distinction to make. I mean, I think uh, we, you know, we went out of our way to interview people like Kim and um, Jack Jackson and Gilbert Shelton. Um, I did a long interview with Crum in the, um, in the 80s. And we genuinely revered a lot of the underground cartoonists' work and, and looked up to them as what cartoonists as a, as a kind of template for what cartoon, how cartoonists should see themselves as artists and the kind of work they should be doing. Um, you know, sort of uh, uncompromising visionary work, which is what the best underground guys did. And at the same time, uh, you, I mean, not at the same time, but uh, a few years after you started the journal, you began publishing comics. 
Uh, oh, yeah. And and I think sort of unnecessarily got a lot of flack for uh, running a magazine about comics and also publishing, but I'm biased, of course. Um, uh, but can you talk a little bit about yeah. that friction and sort of, I can't imagine that the journal benefited Fanagraphics, really. Or maybe it did. Uh, you, tell, you tell us. I mean, how did it, it work of, for and against Yeah, it, it kind of did at the beginning because we acquired a reputation for liking good work and uh, for criticizing what most of the artists that we admired thought was lousy work. Um, I mean, Kim can probably speak to that, but I, th I think initially it did benefit us in the sense that artists uh, saw the magazine. I mean, artists we admired, whose work we admired, saw the magazine and um, saw us as a fellow traveler. I mean, uh, someone who would who would champion their work um, at the same while well, at the same time um, criticizing corporate comics. Um, it became. I think it became more problematic when, and this was probably in the 90s, when we started criticizing what could be called alternative work. And, and at that point, alternative artists liked us a little bit less. Alternative. Because again, that bright, that bright line was you starting mean, I mean, to. I mean, you ran, you ran yeah, criticism of the would, books you published. Sure. Yeah, we would. <laughs> we would. Yeah. Um, and that was problematic. I mean, it was a little problematic. Do you want to expand on that? I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was, you know, there were vibes. I would get vibes from artists. Now, I mean, I was naive. I thought, um, somehow, I thought artists really wouldn't mind an honest critique of their work. Um, that was completely wrong. <laughs> um, artists mind that very much. Uh, I don't know if Kim does, but um, I, thought it was, about I thought it was interesting that it wasn't necessarily a slam dunk that you were going to get a good review in Comics Journal. I bet. That's an uncharacteristic attitude, I've got to tell you. <laughs> I, I can think of one case where I thought that I actually learned something of value from it, and I can think of another case where uh, I'm still not. thinking about it. Mm. Uh, Ruthie <laughs> Penmark, I'd still like to, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was, I mean, I was, yeah, Kim's attitude is, um, is, is quite uncharacteristic. Um, I mean, we would run critiques of artists that I knew personally, that we published. Um, I mean, artists we didn't publish that I knew, and artists I respected, but who just got a, you know, negative review. And um, it resulted in some strained relationships on occasion. I mean, it was, it's a difficult place to be, as you will learn. <laughs> well, yeah. well, you've got to have credibility. And if, if it's just going to be a slam dunk, you're going to get a good review every time. There goes credibility. I mean, come on. Well, uh, right. And I mean, and we only, I mean, we only ever ran pieces that I thought were either intellectually defensible or, or honestly felt. Um, or usually both, I guess. And um, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't reject a piece because it was a negative review of someone we published or an artist I admired if I thought it was a legitimate review. Um, was there ever any moments like in Citizen Kane where you finished the review for the <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, see what I objected to with Ruthie Penmark is she didn't even use her own <laughs> real name, you know? Right, right. <laughs> so that seemed pretty fucked up to me. <laughs> who, who, who was that? I don't even. Well, uh, I won't mention her name. Really? Here. We should. I'm more of a gentleman. Huh. And, uh, okay, okay. What did she say? Do you remember? Was it a negative review? Oh, I don't even remember that. she just she just sort of came in on the last episode of the Search for Smile and Ed and said, "I don't get the joke," <laughs> you know, and. I don't know. I know he's been around forever, but I just don't get the joke, you know. And uh, I didn't appreciate that. Was a review that. did not you did not learn anything from? I didn't appreciate it. I mean, she comes in on the last installment of something. I didn't think it was a fair review. Uh, and she wasn't even. Given